You know, we're here this morning just to honour two fathers, our Heavenly Father and our Earthly Fathers as well. In Matthew chapter 6, if you go there with me, and he's asking, they're asking here really to teach us to pray. And so in Matthew chapter 6, verse 8, it says, Therefore do not be like them for your father. Isn't that good that Jesus says it's your father? Your father knows the things that you've need of before you ask him. And in this manner, therefore, pray our father. Now he talks about our father as well. So we're here just to honour two fathers, our earthly fathers and our heavenly father as well. You know, you cannot overemphasise the goodness of God. The grace of God. I was sharing with Alex on the TV before. He was asking me some questions. But the man that led my wife and I to the Lord gave us a great foundation, the fatherhood of God. I've never believed ever that God made you sick. Never in 40 years, I've never believed that. I've never believed that God put you through tough times, hard times, because, hey, the fatherhood of God, the goodness of God, the grace of God. Can I have an amen or what? So in Ephesians, if you go there with me quickly to Ephesians chapter 6, we'll just look at some of the things here, you know, that spell out about fatherhood, what really fatherhood's all about. You know, and maybe today it's a little what the world thinks. In Ephesians chapter 6 verse 1, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour your mum and dad, honour your father and mother. Is that right? Which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. How many of you want your kids to live long on the earth? And also to have favour as well. I tell my grandkids all the time, favour of God. My, my uh, granddaughter just right now made application to university. She wants to be a paramedic. And she was saying, I don't think my grades are good enough, Pop. I said, you have the favour of God. You, you, you will get in. The favour of God. Is that right? So here's an Old Testament and a New Testament. And, you know, it's the only one with a promise. He's talking about if you want to live long. You know, our, our suicide rate among our young people is horrendous. It really is. My son's a detective in the Northern Territory. Just, and he was telling me, you know, that our suicide rate among our young people is higher than our row toll. Wow. Something is seriously, seriously wrong. And, it, 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 you know, it grates me when I hear young people talking about their father as the old man and things like that. You know, just a little bit of respect. My dad and my mum were married to each other for 74 years. My dad was only a Christian the last 10 years of his life. But I learnt more about respect and family and marriage from my mum and dad than I actually learnt from the church. Uh, you know, my dad grew up in a life. My mum was 98 when she died. My dad was 96. And uh, I remember going in my dad... He was born again for 10 years. They grew up in an era, you know, that you didn't show too much affection. It was like you got a handshake. That was about it. But after I led my dad to the Lord 10 years later, he learned to show affection. You know, that's the grace of God, the goodness of God. So much change there. You know, just, and, and I'm just, we're honouring our parents. My dad grew up in a large family, 12 kids in the family. First up was best dressed. <laughs> One that had the longest arm, ate the most. Half whipped the bed, the other half turned out to be great swimmers. <laughs> you can't say that, I just said it. <laughs> but you don't grow up selfish. I guarantee you that. You know, in our families today, and I love my kids, and I, but we have small families, and it's all about me, I, me, and my. iPads, iPhones, because it's all about I. I feel a love coming now. <laughs> the average person a day takes seven, uh, sorry, 48 minutes of selfies a week. That's seven minutes a day of total narcissism. Don't you know what you look like yet? <laughs> Remember when we actually used to take photos of other people? Anyway. <laughs> but, you know, I, I owe a lot to my dad. I really do. You know, he gave me life for no other reason. You might think you, you have some baggage, but your parents had baggage as well. They had to deal with certain things as well. Is that right or not? And the, the, if for nothing else, you can honour your dad that he gave you life. Think about that. My dad volunteered in World War II. He didn't go off to fight the Japanese, uh, you know, to get medals. He went because his family was being threatened. Just a young man. Was so badly wounded in New Guinea that he, for the first two years he came home, he couldn't work. So I've got a lot to be thankful for. And here is talking about a powerful promise that if you want to live long on the earth and if you want your family to be blessed, is that right or not? Is that honour your mum and dad? Just something about honour. 
You know, and I think that's a forgotten word today. We don't even know what the word means. But here, just a little bit of respect for your father. And our greatest need for a man is to, I believe anyway, just some encouragement. I don't respond to criticism as well as I respond to encouragement. Anybody else or just me? Think about this. Even Jesus needed that. He comes up out of the waters of baptism. He hasn't even performed one miracle. And his father says, this is my beloved son, beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. Now, that's recorded seven times in Scripture. If he needed it, how much more do you and I need to hear that? Can I have an amen? From our fathers, that just a little bit of, uh, you know, criticism destroys. Encouragement is my oxygen. I tell my wife that all the time. Encouragement's my oxygen. If you, anyway, thank you for your enthusiasm on that. <laughs> Family is the foundation of our society. It's the foundation. If you want to destroy a society, destroy the family. And the quickest way to destroy a family is simply remove the fathers and watch a society begin to disintegrate. Can I have an amen? The devil's not stupid, and I believe that's why there's such an attack. Notice that Mother's Day, and praise God for that, is much more popular than Father's Day is. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? I was just reading about that. I, anyway, you know, so God honours, we, we need to honour that God-ordained institution of fatherhood. Just fatherhood. Here's some facts about father. First of all, you have two fathers, our heavenly father and our earthly fathers. Can I have an amen or what? You know, and the, the, a, a man is the image bearer. If you go to Genesis with me, Genesis chapter 1, we'll find here right back in the start, if you give me a moment to turn the pages over, in Genesis chapter 1, <clears throat> looking in verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Is that right? Then God blessed them. I love that. But we are made in the image of God. We are God's image bearers. The first man my daughter ever saw was me. I was there at the birth. I wasn't there at the birth of my boys. I wasn't a Christian. But I was born again and I was there. I made sure I was there when my daughters were born. The first male they ever saw was me. And so a lot of what they, they base, I believe, their understanding of men and things like that is what they see in me. We're image bearers. Hello? And, you know, think about that. And, and you know, some, anyway, we won't go there. Our concept of God is often derived from our earthly fathers. If your father was loving, generous, if he was mean, angry. You know, I was sharing a game with Alec. I'm amazed that I'd say that possibly 80%, the vast majority of people I minister to, Christians, tell me, they don't feel worthy of God's love. Well, you'll never be worthy of God's love. That's why it's called unconditional. Can I have an amen? That, that, that boggles me that they would think that, anyway, they don't feel worthy of God's love. Recently, a young lady that grew up in ministry and she was dying of cancer. My wife went to minister to her and she said, I believe that this is God's punishment for me for past sins. And if that's what's going on in the church, imagine what must be going on in the world, their concept of God. Can I have an amen? And so my wife just ministered to her about the goodness of God, the grace of God, the favour of God. Anyway, so here's some of the things that I believe that Biblic talk about fathers. If you go to Nehemiah, Nehemiah, the shortest man in the Bible. And Nehemiah, if you know anything about the background here, is what's going on there. Their heritage is being destroyed. And Nehemiah is trying to rebuild the walls. And I believe one of the greatest things that we can find from a father is simply protection, that a dad protects his family. I love eagles. You know, I did a book on eagles. I just love eagles. And I'll tell you right now, eagles mate for life, one of the few that do. There's an interesting fact. But also they will defend their young to the death. I can learn something. In Nehemiah chapter 4, and we find here what goes on in verse 13. It says, therefore I position men. men. Is that right? Not boys, not teenagers. I feel the love's coming now. But men. In, in ancient culture, there's no such thing as teenagers. There was boys and men. That's it. Paul writes, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I acted as a child. But when I became a teenager, no, when I became a man, I put away childish things. 
It says, I position men at the lower parts of the wall at the openings, and I set the people according to their families with their swords, with their spears, with their bows. And I looked and I arose and I said to the leaders and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord great and awesome and fight for your brothers and fight for your sons and fight for your daughters and fight for your wives and fight for your homes. If there was ever a word for the dads, that's it. Can I put it in the current vernacular? He stands the fathers in front of his families and says, whether we live, whether we die, whether we win, whether we lose, depends if you've got the guts to fight or not. And if you won't fight for another reason, then fight for your families. Can I have an amen or what? Amen. So the heritage of their nation was, uh, it was in ruins for 150 years and it's restored in 52 days when the fathers stand up. You know, today we're not talking about physically, but our nation is still under attack. Family is under attack. And you know, I think it's time for the dads to stand up, speak up, refuse to shut up. Can I have an amen or what? So we're simply talking about protection here. God is our protector, but also the, the earthly father needs to protect his family. Hey, listen, I'm a Christian, but I ain't dead. You touch my family. I'm going to drive over the top of you and back up to make sure you're dead. <laughs> Is that too deep? I'm a father. I, I'm, and, you know, I made a mistake with my family. You know, I put ministry before my family. And I went, and when I woke up one time, I went and I apologised to my wife and I said, I'm sorry. I said, if it ever comes to a choice, I didn't say God, I said, if it comes to a choice between ministry and my family, then I choose my family. Hello? If you want a word for it, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, if you give me a moment again to turn the pages, I've only got one hand here. He says here, and I love this, but if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially of those of his household, he's denied the faith and he's worse than an unbeliever. That's New Testament. That word provide is an interesting word. It's the Greek word pronoio. It means food on the table. It means clothes on your back. But do a deeper word study, you'll find it actually means to lay down your life for your family. Greater love is no man than this. And he lay down his life for his friends. Can I have an amen or what? I saw my dad volunteer. Lay down his life for us. He wasn't even a Christian. Didn't go off to get medals, but simply because he saw a threat to his family. I'm leaving later, but, so pastor can clean up the mess. Of I had a young man in my church that could preach. I tell you before, God, he could preach. And he used to go off, particularly to Indonesia, and he'd go away for a few months and do all sorts of meetings and that. But while he was away, my, my, my church fed his family. And so when he came, his wife used to come into my office and cry and cry. And she said, I'm married to a big boy that knows nothing about responsibility. I've gone very quiet in this Presbyterian church again now. And so when he came back and I said, well, you can get your head, if you can get your head through the door, hello, I need to talk to you. I said, if you don't stop what you're doing, I didn't say you've got to quit ministry. I said, if you don't stop and get a job and provide for your family, you're going to lose your family. He said, oh, you're just jealous because I can preach better than you. So the spirit of slap came on me. I'll slap that boy. I tell my kids, the spirit of slap's coming on pop right now. <laughs> I'm politically correct as you can pick it up. I said, listen to me, I'm trying to be a father to you. I know it's a foreign concept, but I'm trying to be a dad. I said, listen to me, if you want me to prophesy, I'm telling you this, if you don't stop what you're doing, you're gonna lose, your wife's in my office crying her eyes out because you don't make any provision for them at all. He said, I don't want you talking about. The last time I saw him, I dragged him out of the Darwin Casino by the scruff of the neck. They're no longer married, they're no longer in ministry. His wife came and sat in my office and cried and cried. She said, I'm leaving, don't try to stop me. I said, I'm not even going to try to stop you. She said, I'm married to a big boy. Outward appearance looks great, but he knows nothing about responsibility. A father provides. Can I have an amen or what? Amen. Our heavenly father provides for us. Is that right or not? Man, he's a loving heavenly father. He wants the best. Can I have an amen? Go to 1 John chapter 4 with me. A father shows love and affection. I love that, you know. And that's something my dad didn't, didn't show me at all until well after he was born again. But here we've got 
John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, if you know anything real quickly about Scripture, you'll find Matthew, Mark and Luke, the synoptic Gospels were written within maybe 12 months of Jesus' death. But John's Gospel is written 65 years later. At the end of his life, the man that this is the disciple whom Jesus loves. How many of you know they couldn't kill him? All the others die martyrs' deaths, but they can't kill him. They try to boil him and all. Is that right? Because love never fails. Here's the man that's last at the cross and first at the tomb. Can I have an amen? And this is what he writes in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. If you've got a religious spirit, it's about to manifest. <laughs> but he who does not love does not know God. For God is love. Now, if you can't remember anything else of this message, when you're going through your tough times, three o'clock in the morning and symptoms come on your body, the devil tells you this is God. Remember, God is love. Amen. What is love? Love is kind. Is that right? Love is gentle. Go through and read what describes love is. And God is love. I love that. God is love. It bothers me, as I say, that people in the church, maybe 80% of the people that I minister to say, I don't feel worthy of God's love. But God is love. I love that. God is love. Just last weekend, I did a leaders and a pastors conference up at Toowoomba. And there was an ex-pastor there and he came out and he said, can you help me? He said, I'm an alcoholic. He showed me, he said, I tried to, I've tried to commit suicide. And I just started to put my arms around just, and he, started, he sobbed and just sobbed and he just sobbed. He didn't mean to, me to tell him you're a mongrel. You've missed it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Just talked about the goodness of God, the grace of God. God is love. You know, uh, uh, where I go to, on the Gold Coast, I go to a barber real quickly, you know, rough as bags. I'll, I'll tell you his nationality, his name's Luigi. Does that give you a clue? <laughs> no, he's not Irish. <laughs> and Luigi's rough as bags. Every second word's a swear word, you know, tattoos, everything. Well, I didn't grow up, you know, anyway, but that's cool. And I go to, and he's away, he's a good barber, and he's away. And so there's a lady barber. She's rougher than he is. Tattoos every now. If you've got a tattoo, enjoy it. I just don't want one. Would you put a slap a bumper sticker on a Ferrari? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Hello. And so he's the way, and I'm saying I, I like what ex UK Prime Minister Tony Blair said, never apologize for your values. And I'm just sitting there and minding my she said, What do you do? I said, I'm a minister of the gospel. And the language changed immediately. Isn't that amazing? No more swearing. And now she picks on God and God did this. And how can there be a God and all these poor things? I said, lady, just stop. I said, look, look, look at me, look, look, look at me. I said, you know what, something? God loves you just like you are. Now, I didn't say she's saved. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. I said, look at me. I said, God loves you. She said, you don't even know what I've done. I said, it's not based on what you or I, if it's based on what we've done, I don't qualify. It's based on accepting what he's done for us. And I said, God loves you just like you are. So she starts to cry right in the barber shop. She starts crying. I didn't touch her. I said, I didn't touch this lady. Didn't lay a hand on this lady. <laughs> Two weeks later, she turns up at church. I never invited her, never rammed a track down her neck saying you're a mongrel going to hell. I'm sure she's heard that. She turns up to church. Isn't that better than trying to force something down somebody's throat? Just talking about the goodness of God, the grace of God, because that's what the world desperately needs. Love is the engine that drives the world, people. Ever, is that right? And so I go back a month later and the lady's not there, but Luigi's back and he sees me and he brushes through the people. He walks up and says, I don't know what you did to Helen Cole, but that must be one hell of a church. <laughs> See the change in that lady? I said, well, maybe you need to come too. He said, it's not that bad yet. <laughs> I, I've just found it so easy to share the gospel. Just sit down with somebody and What's happening in your life? Most people like to talk about themselves. And they'll just start. This happened, that happened, and it gives you an opportunity. Is that right or not? Just to talk about the goodness of God, the grace of God. Just even to show a little bit of love just to a world that desperately needs love. Can I have an amen?
My Heavenly Father, an opportunity. I, I was telling Alex the street that I live in a, in Spot the Aussie. Hello. <laughs> in my church with 28 nationalities, my daughter-in-law's Filipino, so that's, that's cool. But I, there's just two families that are Australian born. Across the road is three South Africans. Then I've got, I live next door to an Iraqi Muslim doctor. And then we've got Taiwanese and we've got Japanese and then something else. And away we go uh, from two. Well, how do I relate to these people? I don't speak Japanese. My Japanese is limited to Honda and Toyota. <laughs> how do I relate to the people? See, we all want to go overseas to minister, but we don't even know our next door neighbours. And so I said to Jan, Christmas, buy all of these chocolates, box of chocolates, I'm gonna knock on every door in my street. And I said, I'm starting off with my Iraqi doctor. I knocked on the door and I said, hey doc, we're Christians and with men's give gift. I'm not trying to convert you. Here's a gift, the love of God. And he goes, he don't know how to handle it. Maybe he thought it was a bomb, I don't know. I went to every, every house in my street. And they all took and listened to me. And now when I walk up the street with my dog, everybody comes out, waves to me and says hello. In my letterbox was a whole pile of letters, just thank you for your kindness. Anybody know what I'm talking about? But my Iraqi doctor comes over and he says, Cole, I've got to go away. Will you watch my house? Can you put my, my bin out? Hey, that's what it's all about. Just communicating, just relating. Can I have an amen or what? For God is love doesn't say he has love, it says that he is love. If we had time, we could read the, the story of the prodigal son. I love that. I love that story of the prodigal son. How many of you know the boy, is that right? Just treats his dad like he's dead. Just give us what's mine, I'm out of this place. Is that right or not? Hello. Later on he comes to his sense, suspend it all, is that right? And he's coming back to repent, but his father sees him. That means his father must have been watching out for him. And he runs, different words for running. He sprints, which is against the culture. You've got to tuck up your dresses out and show your legs and, and run. That's embarrassing. He falls on the sun and it says it kisses, but read it. Kisses him repeatedly. <laughs> Shows the love of God. You can't emphasise the goodness of God. Listen to me. The change in my own life since I've had a revelation of grace, it's just amazing to me. My kids, my grandkids, my wife goes, what has happened to you? Like you're born again, again. Instead of being a smart aleck, I know all the, I know the Greek and the Hebrew for everything. What's the Greek for? Shut up, you're boring. <laughs> now it's just the love of God. Just sit down and talk to people. Maybe just give them some money. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Thank you, Jesus. Man, I love it. You cannot overemphasize the goodness of God. People say, oh, you're talking about grace, you're giving people a license to sin. You're going to sin anyway. Don't tell me that. You think, oh, I might have been born at night, but not last night. <laughs> people, is that right or not? No. It's talking about the goodness of God. And Jesus said, my Father. And this is when you pray, our Father. Our Father which art in heaven. I love that. When I... Appreciate my earthly dad, but he had some baggage. He didn't know how to show affection, things like that. But then I realised that he would have been given some baggage as well. He had to grow up in really tough times, depression times, go off and fight, maybe lose his life, come back and so, so wounded and bent up that he couldn't even work. Anybody know what I'm talking about? But when he got saved, that love came through again. You can't overemphasize the love of God. So today we're just here to honour our Heavenly Father and our earthly fathers. If you want to live long on the earth, if you want to be blessed, honour your mum and dad. Father, we just give you the praise and the glory. Lord, I just thank you for the, 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 the homes, the families that are represented here today. Lord, I call them the head and not the tail and above and not beneath that whatever they turn their hands to shall prosper and succeed, that the enemy shall no longer find opportunities to come into our homes and rob and kill and destroy. And Father, I speak blessings over the dads today, the dads, the fathers, the grandfathers. We love you. Show you encouragement. Thank you for giving us life. Thank you for protecting us, providing for us, 
for showing us affection when we desperately needed it. We just give you the praise. We give you the glory. Thank you, Jesus.